Hello, and welcome back to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Meg Carney, an outdoor and environmental writer and author of the book, Outdoor Minimalist, Wasteless Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. The Outdoor Minimalist Podcast has a goal to give listeners actionable ways to waste less hiking, camping, backpacking, and more during every step of their process. Your impact outdoors starts long before you hit the trail and goes beyond leave no trace ethics. You'll learn how to identify sustainable outdoor brands, how to ask hard questions regarding sustainability, and begin to shift and evolve your mindset to integrate minimalism into all of your outdoor pursuits. In episode 75 of the Outdoor Minimalist podcast, we are returning to the topic of dogs. Since I know many listeners enjoy the company of a canine companion, I find it necessary to share lots of tips and insights about how we can create a more sustainable environment for our dogs so they can thrive. Canine enrichment is a topic that came up in one of my earlier episodes titled Conscious Consumption with Canine Companions, featuring Brianna Hendy, creator of Boba the Sustainable Mutt on Instagram. In that episode, we talk about a wide range of topics beyond just pet enrichment. So in this episode, our focus narrows specifically to discuss the benefits of enrichment, how we can enrich our dog's lives through a variety of activities and ways that we can cut down on waste while we do it. To help explain these ideas, I had the pleasure of interviewing Maeva LeBlanc, creator of Destination Trained on Instagram. Enriching our dog's lives and meeting their needs is a big part of pet guardianship. And as a certified canine enrichment technician, it's important for Maeva to share everyday enrichment ideas that you can find right in your home for a budget and eco-friendly solution. Adventuring plans on your calendar? Remember to grab your Lava Linens travel towel on your way out the door. Founded by a mother-daughter team, Lava Linens crafts durable, luxurious travel towels as a more sustainable and better performing alternative to microfiber and cotton towels. Powered by flax and hemp, they're designed to be by your side for years to come. Use the code OUTDOORMINIMALIST for 15% off your next order. Thanks for joining me on the show today, Maeva. I think that was right. (laughs) I'm excited to return to the topic of dogs on the show. I have a couple of other episodes that center around dogs and dog training, but this one more specifically is going to talk about how we can enrich our canine companions' lives. But before we get to all of that, I always start the show by asking the guest how you like to spend time outdoors. As anyone can guess, it's with my dog. I love spending time outside with my dog, just going to new places. I really love seeing him and even myself watching the world go by or little animals, etc. I just love new spaces. I can see him sniff around and discover new smells. And it's really my go-to if I need some outdoor time or in the summer is going hiking or going just in the woods with my friends. That's awesome. I also mostly spend time outside with my dogs they're just so fun to watch and I feel like sometimes it makes me more engaged with the outdoor setting because I'm more attuned to kind of the things that they're interested in too oh definitely I'm watching what he's watching if he's smelling the air or tracking a smell I'm just gonna go and check what he's doing so I will say that this since I've had a dog it's definitely a game changer for outdoors time like I I forget the the rest I forget my phone etc and I just can concentrate on what Whatever he's finding. It's really fun. Since we are talking about dogs today, do you want to introduce your dog or what his name is, I guess? <laughs> Yes, his name is Hugo. He's a Welsh Springer Spaniel, so he's always nose down. Or if he's nose up, he's definitely smelling the air. So everything for him is about the environment and the outdoors even more than me. Yeah, he's a great little guy. He's two and a half years old right now. Awesome. I don't think I've met a dog of that breed in person before, but I've seen pictures of your dog and he's very beautiful. Oh yeah, he's with his little like chest hair, he looks majestic. They're not a very common breed, I must say, and I'm really loving this. He's my second Welsh Springer Spaniel. I just love their little character. They're built for swimming. Everyone thought seeing him as a puppy with his huge paws that he would be like a hundred pounds, but no, he's a good like fifty-five pounds. But he has huge paws, they're webbed, and he can swim for hours. He's built very thick. He's built for the woods and working outdoors. That's awesome. Are they traditionally hunting dogs then for like bird sports? 
Yes, they are for birds. He's he's supposed to retrieve from anywhere. So so this is why the webbed paws from lakes, etc. So yes, he's a sports breed. Okay, I digress. I will get back on track. But it was very interesting to learn about him. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> So I first learned about you, I think, from Boba, the Sustainable Mutt, that account. Yes. I had Brianna on the show, and she mentioned you in that episode. And then I think after that, I started following you on Instagram. And so your Instagram handle is Destination Trained. And how did that start? And kind of what is your general goal with that account? So it actually started as a dog Instagram. I wanted Hugo to be on the internet for just sharing our adventures for my family and friends. I come from France, so sometimes it's not always practical just sending news all the time to everyone. So I just started that little dog Instagram. And as my passion grew for dog training, the dog enrichment, finding more tips and more information on the internet, I just started sharing our everyday life tips for reactivity, grooming, enrichment, and everything that I was doing with Ugo. So it kind of moved towards Ugo in training. And then once I decided to open my business, I changed the name to Destination Trained. And since then, it's been growing and getting really just about training. Of course, Ugo is still the star of this Instagram. Yeah, that's awesome that it kind of just grew into what it is today. And I love your content. So I'm glad that it is there. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful. Oh, thank you. So you said when you started your business. So what is your background in working with dogs? And is that kind of your main career? Or do you just do it as kind of a side gig? So it actually started with a joke between my best friend and myself. I was like, oh, let's open a dog cafe. So I would take care of the dog part. She would take care of the little cafe part. So little did we know that two weeks later, I would be registered at the Ottawa Canine School online for dog training. And I was like, where's my pastry? When can we start that business? So I'm doing my part. So it started there. Like I, I just wanted to get to know more about dog training in general and it just it, it was kind of like a snowball I kind of got really into it for the first year and ended up shadowing and being my teacher's assistant during a class. And then I took all the classes that I could think of and I could see on the internet. And it just grew really into something that became big in my life. It is not my full-time job. I am a project manager and a assistant director. This is very new. And in general, I just work for the arts in Ontario, French arts, actually. And this is my main job, but I do dog training every week. I teach puppy classes online and basic good manners online and do private sessions. So it's a side gig, but it became kind of like a big part of my life and personal life in general. Well, good for you for taking on all of that, because that is, <laughs> I don't know, it feels like a lot of responsibility to be training dogs. And my guess from just what I've seen of your content and talking to you is that you use primarily positive reinforcement training. Yes, that's it. I use science-based training and I full science and the latest news about dog training, etc. And it's based on this. Yes. And how does dog enrichment fit into all of that? Uh, that's a big question. For me, dog enrichment is a big part of any training plan. We have to look at the big picture. Yes, every time we go into someone's home or we meet somewhere, yes, they have an issue. But us as dog trainer, we need to look at the big picture, look at their everyday life, their health, etc. And it, it all comes into a big plan of what can we do to make their everyday life better for the human and then for the dog too. So for me, it, like dog enrichment is a big part of it because they have to kind of cool down and have kind of like a hobby kind of for us, right? That yes, there's work. Yes, we have our issues, but we kind of go home and have those hobbies or downtime that we can go and watch Netflix, read a book, etc. Read your book, actually. <laughs> for me, it's the same equivalent of, yes, we have training, we have to work towards a goal with our clients or even our own dogs, 
but we have to take care of those needs too. Yeah, that was one big thing when I was looking for a dog trainer with my dogs is how I chose my trainer, I guess, was I got a couple referrals for her, but also her first question at the, I guess, meet and greet before we ever did really a training session was like, how are you meeting your dog's needs? And I think Mm -hmm. that that was an important question for me because I was like, oh, they are all different and they're individuals and so they obviously have different needs and she taught me a lot about enrichment so just in the last like two years or so I started learning more about it Mm -hmm. and how important it is for our dogs so would you be able to talk a little bit about the different types of enrichment for dogs and I know a lot of the listeners they have dogs and they bring them outside on hikes and walks and stuff daily so if you could talk about like indoor enrichment versus is outdoor enrichment. Yeah, <laughs> we'll go step by step. <laughs> enrichment, what is beautiful about enrichment is it can be so many things. So as you said, there is the outdoors. What is in the outdoors? It's like, it's smell, it's sight. It can be also listening to sounds. It can be textures. Think of puppies, how we socialize them. We have to socialize them to all those little details of the outdoors, even indoors, etc. So think of all those things as they can be enriching to your dog. It doesn't always have to be a big fancy thing. It can also be just taking it in from the world. So there's a difference. Of course, with the outdoors, we can find more natural enrichment, let's say. So sniffing, tracking something, smelling a tree, watching watching wildlife, etc. This is all enrichment. Watching the world go by is enrichment. And then when we try to take it indoors, this is when sometimes we have a little bit more trouble finding an enrichment ideas for inside the home. But we can always find little things that would use the same, you know, the smell, the sight, etc. for indoors. So Let's say, for example, doggy TV that they have, you can find on YouTube, Spotify playlist, etc. You can play games inside that will use their smell. So really, it, it's all about what your dog loves. Sometimes we tend to offer something that we like that is fun for us, but we have to always remember that it's all about their taste and going at their own pace too. Yeah, I think that that was kind of hard for me because having multiple dogs, I kind of wanted enrichment that I could do all of them at one time, but like I have one pointer mix and he loves sniffing. And then I have a husky mix and he likes sniffing because he's a dog, but yep. it's not kind of his go-to enrichment. His One of his favorite enrichments is like shredding things and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think for me, it was like narrowing down for each dog, what's their favorite thing to do. And what can you do in like one walk, right? I have the same, so my my Spaniel, he's all about no sound and tracking, etc. And I'm often dog sitting my friend Spaniel, but she's a Brittany Spaniel, so she's more of a pointer. So when we go out on a walk, my dog is just tracking stuff, being in the front, leading, sniffing stuff, whereas her, she's nose up, sniffing still, of course, she's a dog, like you said, but she's a lot pointing at stuff. She puts the brakes, so I have like one dog in the front, one dog in the back, and they're so different. It's sometimes, some days, it's just hard to meet their needs because I have to do twice the work, twice the effort. But it's really important to still meet those needs and be mindful of it. And this is actually why I still have just one dog. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I do sometimes miss just having the one dog. I like them both together, obviously, for different reasons. For sure. But yeah, it is a big, it's a big shift and a big commitment. So when we are talking about the individual needs of each dog, do you have any, I guess, advice for dog owners when they're trying to identify what maybe some of those needs would be for the different types of breeds? Because even, I don't know, I'm trying to think of one breeds that would have a, like very different needs, a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. They, I'm guessing they have very different needs in terms of enrichment. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, it's, it's first, when we look at the breeds, of course, there will be breed traits that can help us gear us towards a type of enrichment let's say herding breeds for example you can find all sorts of herding balls online and find ideas etc that will go more into getting those needs met because we have to remember that we have to meet their physical and mental needs right so 
to kind of prevent some behavior issues sometimes by meeting their needs, we can kind of, I wouldn't say fix, of course, it's it's not going to be like, oh, if I do this, my issue is going to disappear. But we kind of will be able to provide that kind of enrichment to our dog. So let's say, again, that example of meeting their needs, like the pointers will do more of chasing, etc. Pointing, watching, creeping. Whereas my dog, I play with enrichment outside, tracking smells, finding the treat, finding the toy, and then playing. So by finding Finding what they were bred for for centuries and centuries, we kind of have an idea of where to start. And of course, they are old individuals. So even if they have breed traits, we have to go and check what they like. Like even my my dog doesn't like puzzles. It's just it's too much effort for him. So instead of being stuck into that, oh, he loves smelling, he loves finding stuff. I didn't push too much. He doesn't like them. It's fine. It's enrichment. It's not frustration, right? So we can start from just finding what the breed might like and just test different things with that in mind. Yeah, I feel like a lot of trial and error. Mm -hmm. That's what worked for me is like, I'll try all of these things and see which one you guys really like. (laughs) So you've mentioned quite a few different types of enrichment already, but what would be kind of across the board would more than likely work for most dogs as a form of enrichment, as just a couple examples for listeners. So something around their meal is usually something that we can't really go wrong with. They have made studies about contra-free loading. So it's a behavior when we will offer two choices. We'll offer just a plain food dish with the food and then either enrichment or just, you know, a towel, a box or something a little bit more challenging. And usually the dog is going to go for the little more challenging. There are scavengers. So the only thing is to find the kind of puzzle and the kind of thing that your dog will enjoy. But with just the fact that they will look for their food and they will have fun, get that mental enrichment going is something that you can try with your dog. And I would say usually kibble and a towel rolled up is a big one. Lots of dogs also like using their paws. So enrichment with their paws will work well. But I would say sometimes we don't have to go extremely far to find a good idea or just like tossing the cup of kibble outside or in a snuffle mat or in just a regular bath mat or something that you can find that is very easy. So just go with DIY ideas that you can try. So it doesn't, you know, like it's not breaking your bank and you can just find lots of things inside your home. We can talk more about examples, etc. but it's usually just around their meal is a good idea to start with. Yeah, you already mentioned a couple of things like you can obviously buy enrichment things. So like the puzzle toys that you've mentioned, or I use topples and Kongs sometimes if it's wet food and then snuffle rugs, you can buy or make those. Or I guess the exchange that would be for that one is the towel, like you mentioned. But what other DIY things could people use to enhance the meal time? You can use cardboards. Like I used to do like big boxes. I say used to because you go change a little bit of his habits. I do lots more enrichment outside now. I work a lot more with predation substitute games. We can also talk about those later. But I used to make big boxes. So you get your paper bags and a box and toilet paper rolls or all those cardboard. They can shred. You can put even your enrichment toys in those too. So big surprise inside or your chews etc so it adds a little layer to their chew time in the day and i would say just lots of towel ideas you can roll them but then you can tie them i like also hiding my enrichment so there's especially for ugo there's that tracking before and finding it and this is the wow the big wow factor at the end the reward is that he gets more even I want to always make sure that it's in his day that it's not about making our dogs work for their food. Not at all. So, for example, for a day that he's very tired, I'm still going to get him a regular either slow feeder or food dish that he would just get his food from. It's not about getting them always tired or making them work for it. It's just about being enriched. So if he hasn't gotten enrichment in his day, then this is when I'm going to add enrichment. 
egg carton, then you can add just difficulty to all those things. I've seen some very elaborate kind of like DIY toys with like strings and then it's attached to bottles that have holes, etc. So it's fun to go on Google and find new ideas for people with kids. For example, it's a great way for your kids to bond with your dog to actually build and make their enrichment for the week on a good Sunday afternoon. And it's a way for them to build outside of always playing in intensity. It's just, it's a good relaxing time and they can build that bond too. They're the ones making it and then giving it to their dog. Yeah, I feel like there are a lot of resources online probably for people if they're looking Mm -hmm. more the DIY route instead of buying all of the like new things. Yeah. So do you have any resources for people that are looking to add more enrichment to their dog's lives? I know that Sit Stay Stella does a lot of trash enrichment and she gets tagged in so many other stories, etc. She does a lot of enrichment around boxes and everything and keeping the recycling. Um, so it's always fun to watch what she got into her trash kind of. And it's wonderful because like we anyways have to throw those. So might as well use them in the meantime. I also use a lot of thrifted stuff. I have makeup brush cleaner. I didn't even know that it existed. Okay. Just go to thrift stores. I go in the kitchen or like object aisles and I just check what could be a licky mat. I have a sponge holder also, like whatever you can find it. You're like, oh, this could be a licky mat. And it's two bucks instead of the fancy one. So it doesn't always have to be big and expensive. It can be trash or just someone's trash is someone else's treasure. This is definitely true. Yeah, absolutely. I think once you have the general concepts, so kind of like you're explaining, like there's the snuffle rugs and then the lick mats and Mm -hmm. the different puzzles would be like equivalent to like the boxes. And then if you wanted to do a lick mat with just like things that you already own, Mm -hmm. you probably more than likely could just freeze some of their like wet food on a plate sometimes. And that is still a lick mat. Yeah, kids plates. Kids plates, you know, they have different little parts in them. So this you can add different layers, a paint palette, like a paint plate has many, many holes. And this you can find them at dollar stores or even the thrift stores. So those really resemble licky mats. One that I really like that I haven't done it for a while because I've been on the road, but when I'm home is like the muffin tins, Uh, using muffin tins for like even putting just kibble in it to introduce them to like a slow feeder idea. Mm -hmm. But you can also freeze things in them too, which I like. Yeah. And like even something that doesn't require any equipment, it's just a kibble hunt. You put all the kibble on the apartment and the backyard. You don't even need a backyard. Like I do this in my one bedroom in the city. I just, I have my dog stay in the hallway and he watches me. Even when he was younger, I would just put him behind a gate or something like this. If your dog doesn't have a good stay, it's okay. You just use management at that time. And then I just hide it. At first, I started with very obvious ones, like it would just not be really hidden yet. But then I started really experimenting. So for a while, I just had kibble all over my apartment. But it's really something it will get their nose engaged. It doesn't have to be for just hunting breeds. Any dog loves sniffing. So this really requires nothing. You can do this in just one room, even of your home, the dog room or whatever they are. So it's, I do enjoy doing it when I go to a friend's place if they have a backyard, but it it works perfectly in the apartment. Yeah, that sounds really fun. I love the different hunting and finding games. And Mm -hmm. is that kind of one of the main go-tos for you? Or what are some of your favorite ones that you would use on a regular basis? Yeah, I love watching Hugo sniff and track something. So this is one of my go-tos. Either I hide his food or I also hide his toy. And I've been working on indicating a smell, etc. So he loves this too. I've started also going a step above with uh, predation substitute games where I hide a prey dummy and inside there's a chew or some meat or just a treat. 
So then he tracks it, and then I open it for him. He usually dances and stuff with it before, but then I open and then he gets his shoes. So it's really important to also think of why we're doing enrichment. This is a big part of the dog enrichment topic is all those activities, they are mainly about sniffing, chewing, shredding, and licking. When we think of those activities, they're soothing for dogs. So it comes from the predation sequence and then, you know, they get super aroused by chasing, for example, they get the adrenaline and then what would they do with the prey? They would chew, lick, shred, or even sniff, smell, right? So we have to think of those activities as they calm them down. So when we think of enrichment in our days, it's also important where we put it in our schedules. So let's think, for example, of a dog, you go out, you have a big hike, or if you have a reactive dog or an anxious dog, after a big stressful moment, it's nice to add some sniffing, some enrichment, or after a big tug or fetch, it's important to help them calm down and be the one providing that activity. So yes, it's important, but we have to understand why we're doing enrichment. It's not only about just getting our dogs busy, it's also about providing them that little balance more in their days. Yeah, I think that is something that I kind of learned as I started to integrate more enrichment is like after I did a really high arousal activity with my dogs, especially my younger dog, he would sometimes have a hard time like settling or calming down in the house. And so doing like a shred game or a lick mat or something right when we got home, it really helped him kind of just like settle in and then he'd usually take a nap. Yep. And so I definitely understand what you're saying with the importance of the sequence. <laughs> Yeah, it's super important. Like, and it's super interesting. Once we got into a rabbit hole of research after this, but it's super helpful. And it's nice because we're thinking, okay, why am I doing this? Of course, when my dog was a puppy, he was socialized, you know, in the winter. So it was super cold here in Canada. And I was working from home, I needed him busy for sure. So I use a lot of enrichment, but now as an adult dog, I'm rethinking just when I put it in my day, right? And it just, it helps him calm down. It's just about rethinking our habits every day. Am I going to go to a park and play fetch right after they have their snack? No, maybe not. Maybe I'm just going to switch and just do a big walk or do the park time and then I get home and I give them their snack. Yeah, absolutely. And that might just come with some trial and error too, like seeing like what oh, sure. is your dog more attuned to and what is working for them. And one thing that I should have asked you earlier that I've been thinking about is like when comparing and trying to narrow down your dog's needs, how much enrichment should you be including along with the physical exercise? Like it is one better than the other or how do they compare when we are meeting our dog's needs? I think it all depends. Of course, it all depends on dogs, but also I think both are equally important. We have to meet their physical needs for sure, but the more we'll go out and think, oh, my dog has always so much energy after a walk, we have to rethink, oh, do they have other needs to be met before thinking I'm going to have to go out more and for longer times? Because then we just end up having athletes at home that have to go on four hour hikes every other day. So we have to think of also ourselves. So we like a hike, we like our exercise, but then we also like that mental enrichment, just being at home, watching a movie, calling family and friends. And who hasn't fallen asleep reading a book? I mean, we don't need physical exercise all the time to be tired. So we have to rethink the way that we meet their needs. We most often think, oh, I have to do that amount of walking in the day and their needs are going to be met. I'm going to have a tired dog. So I would say there's no like same amount of time. And sometimes you can even like on rainy days or tomorrow, it's going to be super cold in Canada, at least here in Ottawa. So tomorrow is going to be indoors day. Tomorrow, he won't get much physical exercise. So I'm going to rely on this. 
of course, on Saturday, he might be a little bit restless, but he knows that I'm going to meet his needs anyways. So there's no exact amount that is like, oh, we have to do as much as, but I would say just with trial and error, I would usually go up the mental enrichment first before going up on the physical exercise. Okay. Yeah. Kind of the same thing with, while well, you're kind of narrowing down your dog's needs and like it might change over the lifespan of the dog too I guess like you were saying with your dog yep awesome well I feel like you shared a ton of ideas and ways that either indoors or outdoors we can kind of get our dogs mentally stimulated and I really like that you have a big focus on DIY and kind of budget solutions because a lot of the enrichment toys available they are quite expensive Mm -hmm. and you don't need all of them so finding ways to use what you already have is also makes it less daunting while you're trying to figure out what your dog actually really likes. So what other resources other than the one you already mentioned could you maybe point listeners to if they want to learn more about enrichment? I know that from dusk till dog, she has a lot of meal prepping. She does a lot of live lives about how to fill up your enrichment, etc. I mentioned already Sit Stay Stella with Trash Enrichment, and I'm a big fan of predation substitute training. So yes, there's a part of training there, but the big part of Simone Muller way of thinking is about let's meet their needs so that we can train. Right. So the basis of her train is is actually all about meeting their needs. So it's all about enrichment in a way. So, yes, it's called training, but I love her games. Her games are really tapping into your dog's need. And she really goes into more of their breed traits and what you can do with different types of dogs and their taste and different games to try out. And I tried them all. And some of them my dog didn't really like. So I stuck with some others. So I would say just going to her page is going to be a big, big resource of information. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. It sounds interesting because I have been looking for new ones for my youngest dog. So She has great books. Her books are like 100 page books. They are really easy to read, you know, very easy to follow the steps. Her book Hunting Together is, is really fun. And it's not specific for dog trainers. It's for dog guardians in general. So it's really easy to read. Awesome. Yeah, I'll be sure to share all of those resources in the show notes and link to those things. So if people want to check them out later, they can go look at that there. But with that, how can listeners learn more about you and Destination Trained? I'm mostly on Instagram. It's all linked also to my Facebook page. So you can just go on either Facebook or Instagram and find me and you go. Most days we'll share something that we did. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I hope everyone learned just as much as I did. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you hear, let me know. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book or subscribe to our weekly newsletter at theoutdoorminimalist.com. For even more updates, educational resources, and to help build an outdoor community with the shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.